Good evening. Um, you are watching School Psych Podcast. Very happy to have you tuning in tonight. Um, cool topic again. Very um, very important topic. Something that's kind of a buzzword too. We're going to be talking a little bit about executive functioning. Um, but my name is Rachel. I'm a school psychologist and I'm working in Maryland. Rebecca? Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm a school psychologist working in Connecticut. And I want to remind everyone that we really encourage your participation tonight. And the easiest way if you're watching us live is to just um, sign into your YouTube account and comment in the live chat box um, to the right of your screen. You can also comment on Facebook and Twitter um, in messages or, or comments using the hashtag Psyched Podcast. And here's Anna. Oh no. Anna. I have sound. Are you muted? Oh no, technical difficulties. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, well Anna is here. For those of you who are watching, you can see her down there with her cat. Um, so I, uh, yeah, there was a little bit of an echo. I think I'm okay now. Um, I'm very excited then to uh, introduce our amazing guest. Some of you know Sarah Ward. Sarah Ward is a Master's of Science and CCC, which I don't, we'll ask her what that means, and a speech language pathologist. She has over 24 years of experience in diagnostic evaluations and treatment of execu executive dysfunction. Miss Ward holds a faculty appointment at uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Health Professions. Sarah is an internationally recognized expert on executive function and presents seminars and workshops on the programs and strategies she has developed with her co-director, Kristen Jacobson. Their 360, 360 Thinking Executive Function program received the Innovate, Innovative Promising Practices Award from the national organization, CHAD. She has presented to, to and consulted with over 585 public and private schools in Massachusetts and all across the United States. Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much for being I'm, here. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me tonight. So can you tell us, because I um, was unprepared for the CCC and I should, have, I should have found what that means. What is a CCC? Oh, it's rather <laughs> silly. The certificate. <laughs> clinical competence, which is required um, to be a speech and language pathologist. Oh. So you that as part of your clinical fellowship to uh, say you're certified. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Okay, good. Thank you for sharing that with me because I've okay. seen it and I've never uh, registered it. <laughs> no. Anna, are you still, yes, she's still muted, but she's still oh. here. <laughs> so Sarah, we are really excited to talk to you. Um, Children with executive function weakness or executive dysfunction are often referred to our offices as school psychologists, and we're often uh, trying to help teachers figure out better ways of supporting um, executive functioning in their classroom um, and uh, figuring out exactly what are the skills that we can try to help support our children, our students to um, further develop with. So can you tell us a little bit about um, executive function as you see it and how you do the same thing, support students and teachers and parents um, with understanding how these skills develop and what how, how do we know when something's going wrong and, and what can we do about all of that? <laughs> yeah, sure, absolutely. And, and I think as we spoke, I'll take advantage of using that screen share and go ahead and, and share my screen for just a minute. Um, there it goes. Hold on one second. Um, you tell me when we're good to go. Are, are you seeing it there? Yes, so, we are. Okay. Oh, cool. All right. So that's my co-director, Kristen, who you just mentioned. And everything you see here really shares our, um, our joint strategies and our program that we've developed. Um, I, I'm only seeing kind of my slideshow. So if if there's a chat there, just jump in and, and ask me a question because I'm all of a sudden just seeing my slides and not the Hangout. But, um, you know, to really help uh, clinicians understand executive control, I mean, I think there's always this confusion between uh, what's sort of ADHD versus what's executive function and kind of the relationship between that and self-regulation as well. And 
you know, if you have ADHD, you have executive function impairment, but it's also possible to have executive function impairment without ADHD. And understanding the relationship between that, as well as all of your students that are referred with spectrum diagnoses, um, anything from nonverbal learning disability, autism, Asperger's, are also definitely going to exhibit executive function challenges. And we sort of want to know what that looks like. So when we talk about executive function, we really focus on these four core areas of the role of the working memory system, um, having what we call situational awareness. And then perhaps the most important is this ability to be what we call a mind mind. So let me just kind of give you a quick sort of overview of that. And I love to sort of um, go right to a classroom because I think that's where we are often getting referred to and teachers are referring kids to us. And so if we look in this classroom, we could, for example, focus on the little girl in the blue sweater. And she has really awesome executive oh. functions. You know what, Sarah, sorry to interrupt. I think that we are still seeing your second slide. For some reason, the slides aren't moving. I do see on the side the classroom photo, but we're just not on there in the, in the big picture. There you go. Is it moving that you're seeing the thought bubble there or not really? Nope. We're still seeing learn it today, use it tomorrow. Cutting edge. So are you in um, your full screen, I'm guessing? We need to back it out of full screen. Um, okay. You'll have to just scroll through it manually. Sorry. Oh, it won't. Um, Okay, no problem. So it won't pick up on the, uh, are you seeing it now, that picture there? Yes, yeah, so we see, our, we see your mouse moving around. So um, you can zoom in a little bit um, to make it a little bit bigger. But when you go full screen, what happens is um, Google Hangouts doesn't recognize that as part of the program. It thinks it doesn't acknowledge pop-ups, kind of. Um, oh, got it. Okay. Um, that's all right. Um, It'll make it a little funky, but that's okay. So um, we won't worry about it. So again, we could focus on this little girl in the blue sweater. And I think what's so important is that teachers absolutely establish routines. You know, here we are in November. They're going to expect that the kids know the routines. And this little girl in the blue sweater really knows the routine, which is that, you know, perhaps every morning they go through calendar time, but that Monday mornings are different. So what you can see is that even though she's sort of still in the circle here, that what she does is she pulls up in this mental thought bubble the fact that she knows that on Monday morning they do writer's workshop. And so you can see on the left here that she's got the image of, okay, I'm going to be writing a paragraph or so. I have about a half hour to do that. And she's already picturing the birthday party that she went to over the weekend. And because she's got that sort of nonverbal working memory, she then has the ability to engage this verbal working memory. And she starts to think to herself, well, I'll write about Lauren's birthday party. It was really fun. And she's even picturing, you can follow kind of my mouse here a little bit, I'm hoping. that oh, yeah. she Actually, Sarah, if you click on your fifth slide, I think because yeah. we're was... still stuck on the, the second slide. Hmm. Um. It's highlighted, though. I see that it's highlighted, so maybe you can click over it with your mouse. Like that one? Is it coming back? No, it's still not moving. It's so strange. I see the small image of the little girl in the blue that you're talking about, but I don't see it in the big window. Um, I'll tell you what. Let me try something for one second. Okay. Um, yeah, and I might have a fix, too, if that doesn't work. Yeah, let me be clever for a minute. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for one second. Let me go back to this. And we'll go back to screen share. Let's yeah. try that one. Is that working? Yes. yes. Okay. And are you seeing it moving now? Yes. Oh, oh nice slide. <laughs> Very cool. So that's helpful because, you know, I mean, here you can see this little girl is totally aware of the time. Now, I'm, I'm, don't know if my, if you, are you still seeing my video of me or no? No. no. Okay, perfect. Then I won't worry about it. I have to shift my direction. Okay. So, but you can see this is really cool because he's aware of the fact that it's nine o'clock. She knows she has to write about a page or so. She has about a half hour to do that. And she's thinking about the birthday party they went to. And notice she's thinking about that entire thing. And she says, okay, well, I know that I'm going to write about Lauren's birthday party. It was really fun. I need an intro sentence and a few details about what we did. 
and she knows the teacher wants expensive adjectives and she's like you know what the pinata was so much fun and I'm gonna write about how my friend got a cool new backpack and she's doing all of that thinking while she's still sitting in the circle so that the minute the teacher says okay boys and girls it's Monday morning let's go back and write in our desk for writers workshop what we did over the weekend she goes back she sits down and she starts writing and that's awesome initiation and transition and I don't have a lot of kids like that on my caseload. <laughs> the ones that I work with are more like this. They're like the kid on the left where they show up and they still have their coat on. You know, they haven't transitioned from the cubby and they don't have what they need and they're kind of what we call a beat behind. And the teacher says, okay, boys and girls, it's Monday morning. Remember, it's time for writer's workshop. And the whole group dismisses and that kid is still sitting there. And at this point, he's the one that's prompt dependent. This is where the teacher has to say, okay, you know, go get your pencil, go get your writer's workshop workbook. And he's still hanging out there at the bookshelf. And the real problem is, is that at the point where he sits down at his desk, he doesn't initiate. And this is where teachers get really frustrated. So teachers come up to them and they say, well, you know, what are you going to write about? Did you play soccer? Play soccer? You know, did yeah, you go fishing? And the problem is, it's like, well, I don't know what I did this weekend. This is going to take forever. So we keep asking him questions to try to get him to see something. But the only thing that he sees is that blank piece of paper. And this example is really important because it talks about one of the very first things that we want teachers, psychologists to understand about executive function is that executive function absolutely starts with working memory, but in a very specific order. So you have to start with something called nonverbal working memory, which is essentially like that mental thought bubble that this little girl has. And that's what drives what we call that if then cause and effect thinking. And then you can talk to yourself and say, okay, well, if I have to do that, then this is what I'm going to include first. And if the teacher wants expensive adjectives, then these are the ones that I'll use. Now, if we contrast that with this other little boy, what you can see is, is that he had no thought bubble at all, right? And so with no thought bubble at all, he has no if then thinking. And really think about the kids that are referred to you. Do you ever notice that these are the kids that are like, super impulsive you know they don't do that cause and effect inhibition thinking where oh my gosh if I do this then this will happen and so the problem is he's got verbal working memory but it's not in the form of self-directed talk and so the first thing we really talk about with executive function is we're evaluating working memory but it's not enough to look at like that digital number recall we really have to look at what is their capacity to create that sort of mental imagery and and I think knowing that is so important and I'll really show you why so when we look at that working memory what happens is is it also drives what we call situational intelligence. I mean, I think a lot of people think executive function is tied to intelligence, but especially as psychologists, you should see a lot of times, you know, teachers refer these kids and they present with average, if not significantly above average IQ. And sometimes it's really hard to even get them qualified for services. And so executive function has really everything to do with what we call the SQ. And I think that's always surprising to um, teachers because they haven't heard of SQ. But what SQ is, is your situational intelligence. And situational intelligence is absolutely crucial for attention and impulse control because it really says that at any one moment in time, you're always aware of what we call space, time, objects, and people. So this idea of space, where am I right now? What time is it? What objects do I need? And really important is what we call people or role. What's my job right now? So again, we say it's sort of stop and read the room. So let me give you um, an elementary and kind of like a high school example of this. So if you're an elementary student and you have good situational intelligence, let's say you had a student in your office with you and you walk them back to class. So that student has to read the space. Okay, I'm in the library. And we tend to focus on zones. There's the fact book zone and there's the easy reader book zone. That's the teacher's personal space and that's the space where the students are seated. We're aware of the time. Okay, we're getting a lesson on the earth. We're aware of the objects. All right, well, there's a globe and the kids don't have anything with them. And so 
Then what we do is we say, well, what's the jobs? All right, well, the librarian is being the teacher and students are seated on the rug being listeners. So then I have to sit down and join the group. Now, that's really good situational intelligence. But if you have a kid who doesn't do that, then this is what they do. They walk in and they go, oh, those books are boring. I don't like those books. Nobody reads those books. Why do they even have them in the library? And then they say to the teacher, oh, I forgot my library book to return. Can I go back to my class? And the teacher goes, no, no, just sit down. And the kid's like, oh, they're on the rug with the black spot. I don't like that black spot. I don't want to sit there. And the teacher goes, just sit down. And the kid goes, hey, I know where Madagascar is. And they walk through the group and they touch the globe. And then the teacher goes, just sit down. And the kid goes, can I close the, you know, the blinds? Because the glare in the window is really bad. And the teacher's like, just sit down. And they're like, that's my space. I don't want to sit where the black spot is. And this is where we see dysregulation, right? Now, all of a sudden, this kid requires a ton of prompts. And so the problem is when you get to high school, it goes much faster. So now when you're in high school, it looks like this. You walk in and you say, okay, space, I'm in the science classroom. Oh, got it. In this moment in time, look at that. Everyone has out their science lab composition book and the teacher is checking off your homework. And my job is to be a homework manager. So I know that I need to walk in, take out my binder and, you know, get it checked. But like think about your kids with say Asperger's. This is what they're going to do. They walk in and they're like, oh, I saw one of those in Harry Potter. Are we going to use those chemicals today? I love using chemicals. Weird. They're the same color as everyone's shirt. But if we get to use the chemicals, oh, those goggles fog. I hate those goggles. That's so annoying. But I guess if we get to use the chemicals, that's cool. And I'm sure you know this kid. This is the kid that sits down, doesn't take out their homework, doesn't get it checked off, and now the teacher's annoyed, right? So the real important part that we absolutely highlight as being the most critical thing that teachers need to teach is the following. And I wanted to sort of show you those two sets of slides for this reason. Um, when you combine that reading the room with that nonverbal working memory, you get a very specific type of processing that is crucial to executive function. And this processing is called mimetic ideational information processing. Now, that's a whole mouthful, but essentially what you do is you mime the idea in your head. You make what we call a mental movie, all right? Now, when you make this mental movie, there are some real specific things that you do. And every single one of you does this all day long. So what you might do is say, okay, I'm gonna get out of work today at 3.30, and I needed to swing by the grocery store. I have to pick up a few things. And there happens to be a TJ Maxx next door. So I was just going to run into TJ Maxx and pick up a few things. And then I will hit the highway around 5.15. And what happens is, is you pre-simulated how your afternoon would play out. But the beauty of this skill is that you can do that with no risk of error. So you might try that out and say, I go to the store, I go to TJ Maxx, I get on the highway, and I'm sitting in traffic. And all of a sudden you go, oh my God, I don't want to be in traffic. That's awful. I don't like the way that feels. So instead what you do is you say, okay, let me try plan B. I'm just going to get out of here. I'll just grab you know, chicken and a salad and go home, and I'll go to TJ Maxx on the weekend. And so we're constantly pre-experiencing that future. Now, what is also important for a lot of teachers to understand is that that future thinking, being what we call a mind mime, has to have four key elements. And if we don't teach our students these four elements, then they'll never ever be independent. And I think that's something that's important to know. And the first thing is, is that you have to start with an image of what something will look like. And if you think about it, if you were to be a student and you say, okay, well, let me go back to my example of TJ Maxx. If all I do is make a picture in my mind of the building TJ Maxx, I actually haven't done any planning. So the next thing I have to do is I have to self-project into the future. I have to see myself in the future. And this is based upon a skill called episodic future thinking. And I want to take a minute to show you this because this is also crucial to one of the techniques that we teach, which is that probably especially as psychologists, you've learned a lot about episodic memory. You know, episodic memory is that 
personal autobiographical memory where you remember where you were in space and time. And the difference is, is that if I asked all of you semantically to give me a definition of, say, wedding, you might say, oh, I know what a wedding is. A wedding is a celebration between two people where they exchange vows in front of friends and family. But that's not the same as if I said, oh my gosh, tell me about the wedding you went to this summer. And you went, oh, it was on Cape Cod and the bride wore pink flip-flops and a beautiful long dress and we partied all night until three in the morning. Okay, well, that was your personal memory. What we now know in the world of psychology, which is sort of three years new in research, is that we have episodic future thinking. We have the ability to imagine ourselves in a future space and time. But think about it and put this all together for a minute. Imagine you have a picture in your mind of the building TJ Maxx. That's not planning. So now what you can do is you can self-project and see yourself at TJ Maxx. That's better, but that's still not planning. The next thing you have to do is what we call mental spatial time travel. You have to imagine yourself moving from, you know, your car to the parking lot, from your parking lot to the building, from the building to where you're going to go. And as you're doing that, that's how you do time management because you feel how long it'll take to get from point A to point B. And the entire time that you're experiencing that self in time, you're talking to yourself. So let me give you the example of how we talk to parents about this and how you can help you know, teachers understand this. So if I say to a child, okay, it's 7.15, we're running late, you've got to go upstairs. I can keep saying to a kid, go upstairs, get ready for school, go upstairs and get ready for school. If a child does not mind mime, then they get upstairs, they walk in their bedroom and they're like, oh, shiny object. And they get distracted <laughs> and they start doing something and mom comes up and goes, honey, it's 725, we have to get out the door. Come on, let's go, bust a move. Get your homework, get your whatever. And now the parent is doing all of the prompting. But if you have really good executive function skills, you are a mind mime. And this is probably one of the most important slides I can show you. So if you're a kid and you're downstairs and mom says go upstairs, remember you mime the future. So the first thing you do is you make an image of your bedroom. And remember, you're still downstairs and you say, well, what do I look like? You self-project and you see yourself in your bedroom. And then you imagine your movement. Well, I've got to go. I've got to get my backpack. I have to go over to my desk. I have to get my homework and my textbook. I need a sweatshirt out of the armoire. And emotion, I don't want to miss the bus, so I better hurry. And you have done that entire thinking before you even open your bedroom door so that the minute you get into your bedroom, you just carry out the plan that you pre-imagined. And this is the key, is that 90% of the time, task planning happens in a different space from where you execute the plan. And this is what a lot of teachers don't understand, is that so many of our kids are now versus not now. So they're like, okay, what do you want me to do now? and they haven't done this pre-imagination. And so it's our job as professionals to implement a whole series of strategies to help kids to do this. And it gets more complicated when you get in middle and high school because you can't see what you're gonna do in front of your classroom. You're at your locker and you have to imagine what am I gonna look like down the hall, up the stairs and down another hallway. Okay, I'm going to science, I have to have my goggles, I know I'm turning in my homework, we need our composition book. Oh, and then I have Spanish after that. If you don't do that pre-imagination, then you are that high school kid that gets into class and the teacher goes, where's your homework? And you go, oh my gosh, can I go back to my locker? And you're chronically a beat behind. So, you know, the big thing is, is that this is sort of our model of executive function is that you can't say to a child, okay, you have homework tonight. Instead, that kid has to use that situational intelligence and do what we say, put on your future glasses and imagine, okay, well, what does that homework look like? And it has to be that mental image of, all right, what will it look like when I'm done? What do I need to do to make it look like that? And what will I need? And we always say that you plan backwards to execute forwards because, again, 90% of the time, we imagine what we're going to do in a different space from where we execute the plan. So we're constantly pre-imagining so that the minute we get into that classroom or at home, 
then we execute forwards. You know, we kind of gather our materials, do our work, and know essentially when to be done. I think the biggest problem that I see is that a lot of programs don't teach this planning backwards and this idea of creating that mental imagination. Instead, they tend to say, okay, get ready for science, get ready for soccer practice, get ready for school, get ready for bed. If you start it, get ready, kids are be prompt dependent upon teachers. And so the really big takeaway is that we have to teach kids to do this gestalt, what we call kind of mind mind skill. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of really neat practical strategies that we can do. Um, I'll, I'll sort of show you a couple of really interesting ones. I'll, I'll jump to this one for a minute. So, you know, a lot of times I see parents will say, okay, honey, you know, you need to get ready for school. We're leaving in 15 minutes. And the kid's like, yep, I know. Now, the mom says, okay, seriously, like, you really need to get going. We've got to get out the door. And the kid's like, yeah, I know. Now, right away, based upon what I've told you, we already have a problem because this girl is starting with verbal working memory. She's saying, I know, and we know executive function starts with nonverbal working memory, right? So the problem is, watch this, the minute mom says, honey, you need to go upstairs and brush your hair and you've got to get your clothes on. Mom is the one who did the mental spatial time travel. And watch this, because I think this is really crazy. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna leave my screen for a minute, come back, because I'm gonna Rebecca, I'm gonna make you do something for me. Okay. <laughs> Lots of parents say, Well, I read a book on executive function and teachers do the same thing. And they say, I put a checklist right there on the counter. So right away we know a checklist is not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we want to figure out, okay, well, why is a checklist not going to work? And that always throws people off because everyone's like, oh, I love checklists. All right, now, am I back on again? Yes. Are you? Yes. Okay. All right, so this surprises people, right, because they always think, but I love checklists. Checklists are awesome. Okay, so, Rebecca, I'm going to put you on the spot. Now, if you do you like checklists. I do. I yeah. really do. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot, and what I want you to do is I want you to share with us um, if you were going to make a checklist for what you had to do tonight or tomorrow morning, tell us about what's going to go on your checklist. Tell us what you got going on. Holy cow. Okay. <laughs> um, tonight I'm going to um, finish this podcast and I'll probably, I usually spend a lot of, a little bit of time after the podcast thinking about it. That would be on my checklist, digest <laughs> this information. Um, and then I would... Um, check on my children and make sure that they are getting ready for bed. Um, say good night, um, and um, and by children I mean my boys and my husband. And <laughs> then, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> then I would wash my face and brush my teeth and put my pajamas on. Um, uh, get into bed. Uh, now, what, I'm going to pause you for one minute because this okay. is fascinating. <laughs> What you should see that where everyone notices that you're doing is that you're gesturing, all right? Oh, yes. And the fact that you did this, okay, I need to like digest the podcast, I need to get everyone in bed, I need to wash my face, I need to brush my teeth. Checklists come from mental imagination. You know, what we do is we have this sort of thought bubble in our mind and we say, okay, I need to do this and I need to do that. And so the fact of the matter is, is that this idea of gesture is a key piece of being a mind mind. And think about all of your kiddos, especially your you know kids on spectrum, they don't gesture. And part of the fact that they don't gesture is a huge problem because they're not doing that mental time travel. You are mentally time traveling. You're like, I need to go upstairs, say good night to everybody, come back downstairs, you know, clean up the kitchen. That's how I remembered my husband. I was picturing. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right? so I'm going to go back to my screen share for a minute. So hopefully we're back on. So the thing about it is, is that this idea of gesture is that a checklist is verbal working memory. And we know executive function starts with nonverbal working memory. And when you gesture, you're essentially giving life to your mental scratch pad and you're creating that emotion. So our first strategy that we really do is often kind of like something to develop this. We want to develop for a kid that nonverbal working memory where they're sort of gesturing through it. 
And then that drives self-talk in the form of stated intentions. So the first thing that I do is I always tell parents and teachers, take an actual photograph. So if your child is ready one morning, take a photograph. And I don't really care whether they're a little kid or an older kid. And what we say is, if you have finished your morning routine and you're gonna get out the door, this is what you look like. Tell me your plan to match the picture. And the whole goal is that you want that student to look at that and now all of a sudden they say, oh, okay, and they start to gesture. I need to go upstairs and brush my hair. I need to come back downstairs to the mudroom and get my lunch bag. And believe me, as school psychologists, this is where I get a ton of pushback. A lot of teachers are like, you know what? We already have that. They're all over the classroom. Mm -hmm. Is this an executive function visual? And the answer is no, absolutely not. And this won't work. And it's important to understand why these types of things don't work. Because what happens is, is executive function is all about being a mind mime. Make an image. What does it look like? What do I look like? How am I moving? And what is my emotion? Well, there's no it gestalt image in this picture. There's no me, I in this picture, and there's no movement. In other words, the difference is, is that the picture on the left is semantic. It's like what we know a wedding is, you know, a celebration. We know these are objects required to be out the door. But the picture on the right cues episodic future imagery, like re-experiencing wedding. So when you have this image of a full photograph, it really gets students to develop that mind-mind skill. So in a classroom, we don't want to put a clip art and say, go clean your desk and match the picture. We don't want to do that because that's not what my desk looks like. So instead, we may clean the desk and get a full photograph. And now we say to the student, okay, walk me through your plan to match the picture. And you have to get that concept of walk me and tell me through the plan so that the student gestures. All right, I'm gonna take everything from the bottom shelf and put the you know, pencils and erasers on the top shelf. I'm gonna stack up the books from high to small, going left to right. And all of a sudden you'll start to see kids develop that mind mime skill. So you can put the photograph right there in the cubby. Hey, time to go home. If you're ready to go, match the picture. But we always laminate or put the picture in a plastic sleeve protector to develop the flexibility. Because I can then draw right on there and say, okay, you know, today though, when you're going home, you're going to have a permission slip. So I can go ahead and draw a picture on there of what that permission slip is going to look like. And, and that helps a lot for students to be able to see. So to give you kind of like another idea, a lot of times I'll go into a classroom and a teacher has this up on the board. But you immediately knowing about executive function have to say that's a problem because is it verbal or nonverbal working memory? It's verbal. And so if the teacher says, okay, I need to see your homework. Where's that? You need to print that. You know, put that away. The teacher has to do all of that directed because it's verbal working memory. Instead, we recommend something like this. You can have, you know, 15 of these laminated for 15 students in your classroom that students walk through the door and now they can see, okay, you know, my morning job is to put my lunch in my bin, to get my homework checked off, to make sure my device is 100% charged, to print off any homework, to check my email, know the announcements, my teamwork job, and to do my morning work. And by seeing that, all of a sudden, the teacher doesn't have to direct it. So look at the difference again between that and that. And I'll show you another example of this. Um, I know I'm jumping slides for just a minute, but I'm gonna show you one more. We use this a ton with our get ready, do done model in the classroom. So we're always getting students to put on their future glasses and to plan backwards. What will it look like when I'm done? Working backwards, what do I need to do to make it look like that? And working backwards, what will I need? So in a classroom, we love to use pictures or even sort of draw, get ready, do done boxes on the board. But I'll show you a couple of differences. If I say to students, your done goal in class today is to make five note cards using the link strategy. And I can demonstrate what that strategy is. 
working backwards, here's the steps of what you're going to do. You're going to take your vocabulary study guide. On the front, you're going to put the term and a reminding word. On the back, a definition and a picture. And this is what you need to be ready. And just like you get ready to do a task, you also have to get done with a task. And I think that helps kids to learn that concept of closing out a task. So that if I'm now sitting at my desk, you can even put the yellow, green, and red to match that, that I can now look and say, okay, my done goal is five note cards. What do I need to do and what will I need? As opposed to that, do you see the difference? If I'm sitting in class, now the teacher's going to, I mean, I'm going to have a kid who's not initiating. He's going to say, okay, what am I supposed to do? Well, where do I get the words? What do I need? As opposed to, again, this. So let me give you another example, which I think is, you know, again, you can kind of see it there. Lots of times, teachers will put this on the board. And again, this is verbal working memory, so kids don't initiate. And the teacher has to say, okay, get out your pencil, get out your note card. But if we convert that to this, it's completely different. Because now, when I'm sitting in class, we really see kids learn to do that anticipatory forethought. Oh, okay. At the end of class, I have a single note card with a summary that doesn't contain details. Working backwards, I have to read the passage and with my three friends discuss the three big ideas. Working backwards, we need our passage, a single note card, and a pencil, and there are three jobs. One of us will be the reader, one of us will be the recorder, and one of us will be the reporter to share our ideas in class. And You'll really see kids begin to do that forethought where they always start with the done. But again, I'll go backwards. If you're in class, you can see what you need to do looking at this as opposed to that. Do you see the difference? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy unbelievable. I mean, even if you look at this one, okay, here this is. I find kids just don't initiate in a classroom when this is up on the board. But what's important to know is that Teachers are already writing this on the board, so we're not asking them to do any more work. All we're asking them to do is to change the order of it and to do it like this. Because now I know, oh, okay, my done goal is that I'm writing in my thoughtful log under the reading literature tab. And in my log, I'm going to make two predictions, and I'm doing different orders. I'm doing a prediction with evidence, and then I'm putting evidence and how that led me to a prediction. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm not going to read. I'm simply going to look at the cover of the book and make a prediction. So working backwards, I'd need my book, my thoughtful log, and my pencil. And to get done, I'm going to share my ideas with the class. So looking at that, all of a sudden, a kid has a sense. Now, it's very important that I also mention one thing here. And I know we're getting a little close on time, and I want to show you one more cool strategy. The most important part about this is I see a lot of times teachers will do this and they will put the get ready do done top to bottom. Don't do that because we know that we tend to look up to the right to imagine something and that's called the anticipatory look. So we're utilizing this program not merely to just get kids organized, but to neurologically develop their forethought. Because if I'm sitting in class, and I look up at the board, I know what I need to do, as opposed to this. Do you see the difference? Yes. I don't know what I need to do. So let me tell you just sort of one other really cool little trick that I want to mention. And that's around time management, because I think getting kids to see and sense the passage of time is really hard. And keeping with the model, our kids are absolutely growing up in a digital world, right? So if they're in the kitchen, they look at the microwave, it's digital. If they look at their cell phone, it's digital. But think about a digital number. If it's, say, 1030, that's verbal working memory because it's numbers. So what, to make time visible, we have to convert verbal working memory to nonverbal working memory. So what we do is we use actual clocks and we use a dry erase marker and we shade right on the clock to make time visible to show students exactly what time is going to look like. And this is a clock that's got a battery in it. We don't hang it on the wall. We put it where a student is doing work. So if a student is doing work in the classroom, the working clock is going to go right by the whiteboard. 
and look at the difference. If I say to a student, it's 10.05, you have until 10.30 to work on your science lab, make sure to write your hypothesis, the list of materials, and the methodology. Well, good luck to you because, again, this is verbal working memory. Instead, we really want to show it like this because all of a sudden, a student can now see the volume of time and can begin to plan, okay, how am I going to utilize that time? And the other sort of big thing that we do, and I mean, this is actually a really good example. You can see here, we have kids where they actually draw right on that clock and they sketch out, okay, how much time am I going to spend studying or how much time am I going to spend writing my essay or learning my vocabulary words or whatever it is. And so by drawing on the clock like that, what a student does is they pre-experience and they have forethought for the passage of time. And so it's really helpful for kids to kind of be able to do that. Um, and let me show you sort of one other little trick thing that we do too. Um, one of our other favorites is we also use magnets and we put magnets on a clock because magnets allow us to say, okay, when am I going to start my task? When am I going to end my task? And where do I want to be at my midpoint? Because people absolutely think in time markers, you know, none of us get in the shower and say, I'm going to shower until the hot water runs out. We wake up in the morning and say, I have to be out the door, you know, at 750, which means I need to be out of the shower at 720. I need to be dressed by 730. And we're picturing that analog clock. I can't tell you how many kids don't think in analog time. And that's just a really, it's a huge problem. And so again, look at the difference. Finish your vocabulary. We're transitioning to science in a half hour. Well, that doesn't help any kid because it's verbal working memory. But if I have this in say a resource room, okay, your done goal is to have these five cards and you have that half hour to do it. So at my midpoint, I wanna have at least two and a half cards done. It's really clear and gives me this visual nonverbal feedback that essentially I'm mind miming the passage of time and I can really see how much time I'm gonna spend. So we really spend a lot of time working on making time visible. So if you look at this and it's 1015 and Anne needs to transition to science class at 1055. So we can see here that that's what she's gonna do let's say she's writing her essay about Title IX, she needs to look through a library book and primary sources she has on women in sports, and by the end of the class she needs to have four facts, two about the proponents and two about the opponents of Title IX. By looking at this, we can then set a timer for the midpoint of 20 minutes, oops, so that at the 20 minute mark, Anne can say, okay, my goal is to have at least two articles, and my done goal is to have four articles. But that gives that visual feedback of sort of mental spatial time travel. And so being a mind mind for that kind of skill is really important. Um, and again, you know, you can see here, we really start in the middle and we always draw in a clockwise direction so that students can really see, okay, what is that half hour going to look like? And we oftentimes love to show them the future picture. Okay, when I'm done, I'm going to lunch so that they know what to anticipate next. You know, so there's my picture of an apple. Isn't that cute? Okay. And again, if you want, you can use multiple colors. You know, you can show students how much time do you have to gather your materials and get ready and how much time do you have to sort of put everything away and to transition. Because I think for many of us, even though it might be a half hour of time that we've blocked, actually, it may only be 20 minutes of working time by the time you get your stuff together and get your stuff put away. So we have to really teach kids the realistic sweep of the passage of time. And it just is so crucial for kids to learn that idea of, okay, I'm going to start and then I'm going to work for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And let me find out, okay, where do I want to be at my midpoint? And I can really check in so that if I'm reading, I might say, okay, if I'm reading 10 pages at that yellow midpoint, I want to be five pages in. So anyway, I know we're a little, you know, close on time and I have the gift.
so, yeah, so, so helpful. I do have a question, Sarah, if you don't mind. If I'm imagining trying to um, support a teacher using this um, clock strategy um, for sus helping kids not only initiate tasks of independent work, but also um, sustain their attention to the, the whole group lesson. So how would that look? So the teacher's going to, you know, normally the teacher might have the, you know, it, this is literacy block. It, during this block, we're going to do this, this, and this. And by the end, I, I, you're going to, you know, think, pair, share, and then do your worksheet or whatever. Could she absolutely. structure this for a whole class? And how what would that look like? Yep, absolutely. Let me pull up a picture for you that would be really helpful. So, um, and let me go to this one. Um, let's see. Oops, hold on one second. Um, Okay, so I think I need to go back to screen share. Am I still screen sharing or no? No. Okay, so let me screen share for a minute here. So, um, and again, it don't don't look at it necessarily from just this example of an app. I mean, yes, we have an app, and you know that's cool, but that's not the reason why I showed you. You could project an app like this, or you could even have the clock in the classroom where you've shaded on the clock. And this is an example from a classroom where we have a teacher who has said, okay, she's running um, whole, whole class, but the class is splitting into groups. So what she'll do is she'll say, in each of your groups, determine your midpoint goal. So this group on the left, they were doing um, Arctic survival. And they said, okay, at the midpoint, we want to have at least three Arctic survival strategies. Now, this group over here on the right was filling out a graphic organizer, and they said, our goal at the midpoint is to have half an organizer filled out. And this group down here was writing their paragraphs, and they're starting to write their essays on Arctic survival. And this group said, okay, our midpoint goal is to have at least one paragraph done. And so what happens is now the whole class starts, this clock is in front of the entire class, and the kids can really begin to regulate. And I get feedback from teachers all the time that this is so powerful because kids who before would never initiate and then all of a sudden say, what do you mean we're out of time? You didn't give us time to work on it. The teacher's like, well, no, I gave you time to work on it. You just weren't paying attention. But you know what happens is when students see that passage of time right there and it's the sweep of time, all of a sudden they're really regulating and saying, okay, am I, is what I'm doing in front of me now match my time marker or my time goal? So it really makes it very visible. Did that help a little bit? Absolutely. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It makes so much sense. And it doesn't seem like a very, um, I, you know, once the teachers sort of teach the strategy of thinking, planning backwards, it doesn't seem like it will take any more time than what they're doing now. And it so no, it doesn't. And the, and the feedback I get all the time from teachers is it, it took me a minute to like kind of shift my thinking. I mean, I was already writing it on the board, but I tended to write it linear. Like you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. They said I had to just shift a little bit and to say, okay, you know, here's the done goal. And you know, I, again, I can show you just kind of um, an interesting example here. For let me let me. I know we're close on time. I'll show you one more quick picture that might help a little bit. Um, and what they say to me all the time is, it's sort of funny, they'll actually say, I kind of feel insignificant now because <laughs> you know, all of a sudden kids are independent. You know, they're not saying to the teacher, okay, what am I supposed to be doing now? What I need to do? And every teacher says that it really finds them time all of a sudden. They really feel like, wow, I, I can, you know, do more with my time. Um, let me let me show you a, a couple of really quick, interesting pictures, um, and then I know I need to sort of stop talking. I mean, hey, I have to, have to gab. Um, yeah. Am I screen sharing again here? Not yet. No. Uh -huh. One second. Let me put this back in like that. Close on that. Okay. There it is. Okay. So to give you a couple of like real classroom examples, I was in um. Uh, this will actually this comes from my coworker Kristen. She was in a classroom where the teacher had to differentiate instruction. Now the problem with this is, I mean, you have a lot of kids where this is so much language on the board that they're like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> and kids don't really initiate. But if we convert it to this, now you might look and say, wow, that looks like a lot. But kids really learn, oh, okay, to start with done. If I'm in group A. 
I'm writing a paragraph to explain the author's purpose and I'm supporting my opinion. If I'm in group C, oh, I'm just talking with my group and we're writing a single sentence on the author's purpose. So kids really suddenly learn, okay, what is it specifically that I need to do? Um, you know, here's an example from a classroom where it's just so easy, you can use construction paper, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, you can put this on a smart board and notice teachers are, they already were gonna do this anyway. So all they're doing now is just typing that into the done. And this, and you'll see kids really learn to look to the right. Oh, okay, when I'm done in class today, I've done the final draft of my monster paragraph. And what do I need to do that? Well, I've got to type it on, you know, my paragraph on pages. Um, if you look at this example here, I sometimes just have teachers even make construction paper pages that say do and done. And so they can just say, okay, when you're done, this is what you're going to do, and this is what we're going to do in class. So even if the teacher already wrote it out, then what we have them do is at least identify where they are in the process. Um, and I had one other really cool slide. Oh, I love this one. Um, I'll show you two more. You know, here's a teacher where, look how simple it is. I mean, there's nothing, there's no poster, there's nothing special. Your job is to find two or three just fit books. How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to choose a book. You're going to look at the words, use your five finger rule, and then put the bin, the book into the bin, and then working backwards, return to your class quietly. And how cool is that? And look at that with the clock. You have 15 minutes to do that. And that doesn't take a long time for a teacher to do, but that's much different than verbally saying, pick out your book and put it in your bin. You know, kids are really seeing, okay, what's my job to do that? And if you run executive function groups, we run a lot of executive function groups and we have a lot of psychologists that do. We'll even do it with um, like this, you know, if kids are planning their um, Halloween costumes. Okay, well, I know I wanna be a penguin, so I went online and I found a bunch of penguin outfits and I printed pictures of what I liked and then I cut out all the parts to decide, okay, Here's how I'm going to make my costume. I'm going to paint my face. I'm going to do a black sweatshirt and pants. I'm going to put white felt on the stomach and make black felt for the arms. And I'm going to paint sneakers yellow and wear orange socks. Now, working backwards, what's the best approach to that? Well, I should probably paint the shoes first and let them dry. <laughs> so see how that works? Yeah. It's a really cool thing to help students with backwards planning. So you can do it um, whole class instruction. You can even do it in kind of individual therapy sessions with kids. That's fabulous. <laughs> All of this is really cool, and it kind of makes a lot of um, intuitive sense. And I, I like this the concept of the mental spatial time travel. And so I, I have kind of a comment and then a question. So one, I, I now that I'm thinking about it, I you know, there's certainly times when I'm picturing what I'm about to do, and I can remember like sitting down on the couch and saying, "Oh, the kitchen's a mess. I really have to get upstairs and clean it." And I'm wondering too if there's some a little bit of reinforcement that I find that I motivate myself sometimes by picturing, okay, I would do this and I would clean this and then, oh, I picture this nice clean kitchen and that's kind of like motivating and rewarding to myself, um, like a, a little bit, does that make sense? Is that a little yeah, bit? Absolutely, as a matter of fact, we have this awesome um, phrase that says motivation comes from the imagination of the future. And that really makes sense. An example and then I'll give you the academic example you know so here's the funny thing about it is is if I say um, I want to lose 10 pounds for my Thanksgiving vacation okay so what happens is is you put a piece of cake in front of me and I pull up that minute thought bubble and I see myself in my swimsuit you know in the Bahamas in Thanksgiving. okay <laughs> and that's gonna help me say uh, yeah I don't want the cake now if I'm going to the Bahamas tomorrow and you put cake in front of me, I'm not losing 10 pounds by tomorrow. So I'm like, ah, oh, forget it, you the cake. <laughs> if I'm going to the Bahamas in February and now February is like so far out there and you give me the cake, I'm like, ah, oh, whatever, I can do whatever. So the thing is, is that the distance from where you are to how far in the future you can see is called the spatial temporal window. And I don't, I mean, this is really fascinating. I don't know if you know this, but um, did you know that high schoolers, neurologically, they can only see 24 to 48 hours a day? 
And so if you think about it, you have a high schooler who has an essay due in a week, they're like, whatever. And they don't initiate. And then all of a sudden, you know, four days, they're like, yeah, I really should start working on that essay. And then all of a sudden, they pull that essay into view in that 24 to 48 hour mark. And that's in some ways healthy procrastination. Oh my God, I can see it. Now I better start working. But the problem is, is when the essay is more involved, it's an eight page essay, and it's more than I can do in those 24 hours. And so that's why we as support staff have to really work on helping our kids have a clear visual of what the essay really comprises instead of just giving them that linear list of the steps of what they need to do for their essay. And so that's how we really help a kid go from intention to action is taking those complex assignments and turning them into that nonverbal working memory. We spend a lot of time doing that. And, and why is it that the nonverbal piece is so, so important? Why, why is that so key? Because the nonverbal working memory allows us to have a gestalt and it allows us to do the mental spatial time travel because we can imagine going from point A to point B to point C and what we're going to look like and the action that we're going to take in that space. So if you think about it, um, and I'll, I'll give you a really good example of this again. Let me, um, let me just go back and screen share one more thing. Um, I'm like jumping between two screens here. So give me just one second. And I have like three PowerPoints open, yay me. Okay, um, uh, let me show you a really good example of this. So the thing is, is that when all you have is a single word, the word doesn't evoke the gestalt action of what it is that you're going to do. So I'll give you two really good examples of this. Um, let me go to that and then you need screen share. Okay, so here's my screen. Are you seeing my screen again or not yet? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me go to this one. All right, so are you seeing that now? Yes. Okay, great. Now, here's a good example. You have a student, and this is their agenda book, and they need to do science, Spanish, math in their poster. Well, if all you do is read those words verbally, and think of all of our Asperger's spectrum kids, they are left hemisphere kids who think in words. Then I don't really have that much homework tonight. All I have to do is science, Spanish, math in my poster. So what? I have four things to do. But that is not what you do when you engage anticipatory forethought. What you do is you're at your locker and you pre-experience doing the homework. You say, okay, that's the agenda, but I'm going to be doing homework at home at 4.30. So now you're mentally, spatially time traveling. You don't see science. You actually or read the word science. You see yourself doing the science. I know I'm reading the chapter. I'm answering questions. And that's what makes you put your textbook in your backpack when you're at your locker. You don't read Spanish. You see yourself doing the vocabulary cards from the Spanish workbook, and therefore you put your workbook in your backpack. And it goes like that, where you are constantly seeing and pre-experiencing. Now, the kids who don't do this, where they pre-experience, if this is all they do, they get home, and then they sit down, and they finally take this out, and they go, oh, uh-oh, I left my science textbook back at school. I need a ride to go back to school. So the visual is what allows us to truly experience exactly what that task is going to look like and what we need to do. Oh, and there's those normative values, by the way. That's how far into the future we can And kids with ADHD demonstrate a 30% developmental delay in this skill. So go back to your first question about attention. When you look at a student who is seven years old in, say, first grade, they're supposed to be able to handle like a several hour agenda. But neurologically, if they have ADHD and they're demonstrating this 30% delay, then they're more like a three and a half year old and they're focusing at best five to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really hard. And so, again, mm -hmm. we don't develop that visual spatial anticipatory forethought then they remain prompt dependent upon us so we've got to really develop that skill it makes a huge difference and again you know it, it really makes a lot of sense because if you tell a kid okay you know that project is due a month from now they're like whatever it's due a month from now <laughs> and then 
all of a sudden they go, okay, versus I'm going to get that done two hours. I mean, you know, it's a difference between whether you can actually see it or not. And so we have to help kids kind of pull that into view. And do you find that they start to internalize as, as um, they're using this thinking backwards plan and they're starting to imagine what they're going to have, when, what they're going to look like when they're done? Does it start to become a habit? Does that skill get stronger? Absolutely. I mean, we know we can teach it. We know we can develop that skill and actually close that gap. And it makes all the difference in the world. Because, you know, again, like if you look at this example here, and um, let me just do one thing like this. If, if you say to a student, okay, and this is where it becomes more complex in the high school, you know, we're no longer just saying get ready and go to school. Instead, what we're saying is, okay, you have your morning routine, then you have chemistry, then you're going to go to your free block, you have lunch, then you have Latin. After school, you have your ACT tutor, so you need to make sure you bring your ACT notebook with you, and you have a soccer game tonight, so is your uniform clean, and you've got to study for your Spanish test, you have your workbook with you. It's Again, we don't just look at it as a linear list like that. We have to teach kids to sort of do this, and I'll show you what this looks like, is this. All day long, they have to be saying, okay, I have calculus, and then I'm, oops, sorry, I've got a glitch on my thing here. Hold on one minute. Let me go back to this one. Um, sorry about that. Uh, you know, you have to say, okay, I have that English class, and then I'm going to go to lunch, and then I have a free block, and this is what I have to get done in my free block because I have a field hockey game tonight, and I have to study. And you have to constantly be kind of pre-experiencing that so that you know what materials you're going to bring with you and what you're going to do. But if all you do is think about it linearly, then you show up to your ACT tutor, and you don't have your notebook, and you show up to your game, and your uniform's dirty. So we have to really support kids in developing that skill. Sarah, thank you so much for this presentation. It was so detailed and technologically savvy and just awesome. Thank you so much for, um, for joining us tonight and, and teaching us a lot. It was amazing. And um, our viewer, Serena, found the app 360 Thinking Time Tracker for $2.99 in the App Store. So thanks, Serena, for looking that up for us. Um, we've got a wrap. Yep, Bob. Oops, uh, Anna, you cut out, but if I can speak for you now, since we can't hear you, uh, we um, are really, really grateful to Sarah for being here, and um, we look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you online. Leave comments on Facebook and Twitter and um, on YouTube as well, and um, next time we have we'll be having another amazing guest linda lantieri is going to be with us um, discussing her inner resilience program and mindfulness um, and that will be two weeks from today i believe so um anything else that i'm forgetting to wrap up with rachel yeah so <laughs> thank you so much for for joining us yes yeah, sarah thank you so much you guys <laughs> thanks everybody have a nice week good night